This is London, one of the largest and most successful cities on Earth. Wow. Its story spans 2,000 years of daring invasions, catastrophic fire, heroic ambition, and astonishing technological transformations. From the Romans to the Tudors, from the Vikings to the Victorians. For years, this was the capital of the world, ruling over an empire of billions. So how did London rise up from an uninhabitable marshland to become the thriving 21st century city we see today? In this series, we'll reveal the crucial events that changed the very shape and size of London. I'll be digging down into the latest research to uncover conflict, betrayal and power politics. I'll be getting special access to some of the city's most extraordinary sites. And I'll be exploring the innovation and engineering brilliance that gave rise to London's most famous landmarks. So join us as we go on an amazing journey. Absolutely brilliant to discover exactly how this incredible city was created. So far on our journey, we've seen a small settlement on the banks of the River Thames grow to become the capital of England, boasting some of the grandest buildings in Europe. I feel like an ant in a space like this. We've witnessed how the greed of Henry VIII changed the face of the city and tracked the devastating plague that wiped out a quarter of the population. In this chapter, we pick up the story of London in 1666, when the capital faced a new disaster that threatened to wipe it from the map. By the mid-17th century, London's population had reached 350,000. The city spread some five miles from east to west, and it was thriving. But in September 1666, London experienced one of the biggest catastrophes in all of its history, and it started right here in the heart of the city. This is Pudding Lane, a street that earned its name from the puddings, or awful sausages, that butchers used to produce here. But today it's most famously associated with the Great Fire of London, a blaze that started as a simple yard fire and ended up nearly raising the entire city to the ground. But recent research into documents from the time has revealed that the actual start of the Great Fire was just around the corner from Pudding Lane, here on Monument Street. This was the back of a bakehouse belonging to a man called Thomas Farriner. It seems almost incredible that a small fire in the backyard of a baker's shop could do such damage that it threatened the survival of a great capital. But that is precisely what happened here on the night of the 1st to 2nd of September, 1666. A hot summer had baked the city dry, and strong east winds whistled through the streets, ideal for spreading flames from one timber frame building to the next. Add to that that the fire started at a time when it could do maximum damage, in the early hours of a Sunday morning when most people were blissfully asleep. The fire had time to take hold, and the results were catastrophic. The fire spread rapidly outwards from Farriner's bakery, fanned by the winds. It tore through warehouses on the riverfront, storing pitch, tar, hemp and other flammable goods. It laid waste to homes and shops, and it sent people scattering into the streets, trying to save themselves and their possessions. Panic among the city's leaders and inadequate firefighting methods meant that by the time the wind dropped and the fire had been brought under control, Almost all of old London, the Tudor houses, the Norman buildings, the Saxon churches had been destroyed. In five days, the fire had consumed over 13,000 houses, 87 churches, most of the buildings of the city's authorities, and famously, St Paul's Cathedral. I'm scaling the memorial to the Great Fire 
the monument, to relive the experience of the famous diarist Samuel Pepys. On the 5th, just as the fire was starting to die out, Samuel Pepys climbed the tower of All Hallows Church in Barking, just over there, to see for himself the devastation the fire had wrought to his beloved London. He later wrote about it in his diary, saying it was the saddest sight of desolation I ever saw. I became afeard to stay there long, therefore down again as fast as I could, the fire being spread as far as I could see. Nearly 80% of the city of London down there had been reduced to ashes. The survivors could only look around their ruined city and despair. 100,000 Londoners were homeless. The Great Fire was one of the most disastrous episodes in London's past, and many thought it would never recover. But it had taken some 1,600 years to build this city, and it was not about to be snuffed out. One man saw the almost total devastation as an opportunity to build a grand new capital. Ask a Londoner and they'll most likely know the architect of this great cathedral, St Paul's, was of course Sir Christopher Wren. But what they may not know is that this London landmark with its splendid dome was one part of a much more ambitious, grand plan. And if Wren had had his way, London would look radically different. A week after the Great Fire had almost razed the city to the ground, King Charles II invited ideas for a new London. And Wren responded. Historian Leo Hollis has studied Wren's plans for a new kind of London. Wren imagined a modern city that would compete with Paris or Rome. Exquisite to look at, elegant, ordered, measured. One can sort of see a brand new grid system. There are these squares, these piazzas. He was thinking about the grand public spaces where people would meet. Although Wren's plan was considered, it wasn't approved. But there was one significant feature that was, eventually, given the go-ahead a magnificent new St Paul's Cathedral. To get it commissioned, he first had to build an elaborate model that's now locked away in one of the cathedral's hidden rooms. I mean, it is like a Wendy house for a very, very spoiled child, isn't it? Wren's first two designs had been rejected outright, so he was hoping this model would persuade King Charles, the church bishops and city officials to give his third design the go-ahead. Wren was convinced that this was the one. So he and Charles thought that building the model would be the thing that would persuade all the other partners within the deal. And did it work? No, it was a disaster. Again, the bishops hated it. And it was said that Wren went home and wept that night. But Wren did create one more design, and that finally got the approval of all the important clients. What happened after that was extraordinary, which is Charles whispered into Wren's ear, you can make any alterations that you like. You don't have to come back, just start building. And almost instantly, Wren started to rethink the whole cathedral. In the end, it took 35 years to complete. And the most ambitious part of the whole cathedral was its famous dome. Even today, it dominates the skyline. But imagine if Wren's scheme had been accepted and London had been rebuilt according to his plan. Instead, it retains its irregular, rather chaotic, but I like to think rather charming streets. And within a few years, it was back up and running. And it would grow bigger and richer than ever before. But it would also become a city divided. While the super-rich turned London into their playground, it was a very different story for the poor. Within just 10 years of the Great Fire of 1666, large areas of London had been rebuilt, giving the city a grand new facelift. But in those run-down areas that escaped the fire, whole streets became ghettos for the poor. Here in St Giles, on the eastern side of Soho, houses were divided up, and in some, 
between 50 and 90 people could lodge for the night. The alleyways in the ghetto decayed into a squalid, overcrowded slum, known as a rookery, after the nesting habits of rooks that roost close together in large, noisy groups. With all this came sights and smells that offended the rich men and women of the city. They, in turn, began to look elsewhere to build their homes. Just like today, the wind usually blew to the east, taking London's dirty air with it. So the rich looked to the west, with its sweeping green landscapes and sweet, fresh air. In 1700, the land between Regent Street and Hyde Park, that we know today as Mayfair, was still open fields. And it was owned by the powerful Grosvenor family. In 1720, they set about developing a grand residential estate. I'm meeting Professor Elaine Chalice at the London Library to look at the original plans. And it's amazing to see the fields in the background there. You know, you really have a sense that it's just on the edge of London. Absolutely, yeah. London is just gradually moving out. And so you've got areas which are still very rural. People with cattle and grazing and crops. The Groveners began to build palatial London homes for themselves and other wealthy families. And the jewel in the crown of their desirable new estate was Grosvenor Square just south of present-day Oxford Street. It was very fashionable. Grosvenor Square was the biggest, the best, the most advertised, and the most expensive. This, this is aristocratic heaven. The Grosvenor Estate and other wealthy developments nearby pushed the western edge of the capital out by over half a mile. It laid the foundations for Mayfair and eventually London's famous West End. Once the capital's rich and titled had moved in, they set about turning this stylish new area in the West into their playground. And I'm meeting writer and historian Joseph Friedman to find out how these wealthy Londoners lived. Tell me a bit more about this lifestyle, this excessive, decadent lifestyle. There were parties morning, noon and night. It might begin with a levy attended perhaps by 100 people in the morning. Lunch parties, card parties, musical parties, balls, assemblies, and this would go on all night. Some parties only began uh, around midnight. Why did they spend so much time in London? Why did they invest in it in such a way? London in the 18th century was perhaps a more important capital city than that of any other nation state in Europe. London was the centre of political life, commercial life, cultural life, social life, etc., in a way that uh, other foreign capitals were not. As the capital's wealthy were living it up in the rapidly expanding west side of the city, the situation for the poor in the east was getting worse. Here, people lived in crowded slum housing and workhouses, and life was so hard that many were forced to beg for food. But there was something they could afford that made life's hardships easier to bear, gin. Gin had been distilled in London for several decades, but increasing poverty and harsh living conditions meant that people were turning to the bottle rather than more expensive drinks like beer. In 1735, Londoners consumed more than six million gallons of gin. That's half a pint per adult per day. Anyone could distill and sell it, and there were over 7,000 gin shops trading in London. Taverns advertised, drunk for a penny, dead drunk for two pennies. Cheers. Cheers. One man who knows about the effects of gin on the poor of the East End is Olivier Ward. I'm guessing the stuff that we've got here isn't quite the same sort of stuff that they were drinking in the early 18th century. I couldn't be further from it. Theirs would have been badly distilled and often filled with oil of vitriol, to like turpentine, sulfuric acid, and methylated spirits in there. By 1750, gin consumption was at its height, with Londoners swilling back 11 million gallons a year. In the poorer areas of London, it seemed that everyone was permanently drunk. In the East End, almost one in four houses would have been making gin in one way or another. So gin is the sort of crack of 
18th century London. Absolutely, and, uh, and an epidemic that would be akin to a crack epidemic today. It really was as bad as that. This level of drunkenness led to a complete breakdown in the quality of life. What was the effect on London as a city? The craze just ripped apart society and just completely deconstructed the very fabric of it. It pitted people against others, neighbours, friends, because it relied on informants uh, to tell the government and the police who was making these backyard gins. We hear these phrases dating from the gin craze like mother's ruin, which kind of imply that women were drinking a lot of gin. I mean, is that actually the case? Uh, well, I mean, everyone was drinking gin. It was man, woman and child, so it wasn't just women. Uh, but yes, there is a, uh, a case, Judith Darfour, um, who uh, actually took her child into a heath, uh, murdered it to sell its petticoats to buy gin, and then returning to work later on that day as if nothing had happened. Gin-related crime soared, and mother's ruin was blamed for the deaths of thousands of men, women and children. When the death rate climbed higher than the birth rate, the government was forced to act. So they outlawed small gin distilleries. And eventually, the period known as the gin craze came to an end. Meanwhile, in the west of the city, it was a very different story. The rich had immense amounts of money to spend and their wealth would transform the West End into one of the best known shopping districts in the world. Instead of spending their wealth behind closed doors, having tradesmen deliver textiles, shoes and hats to their houses, the rich now wanted to be seen out and about perambulating the stylish streets. And so the West End shopping experience was born. In the 18th century, London's West End grew bigger than Mayfair and spread to include Marylebone and Fitzrovia. It would eventually see the creation of famous shopping streets like Piccadilly, Regent Street and Bond Street. The city became a world-renowned shopper's paradise. Visitors came to London specifically for the shopping experience and were amazed by the range of goods on offer. By the 1700s, people could buy whatever they wanted in London because the city was at the centre of an explosion in international trade. And that was down to one thing, the River Thames. The Thames has always played a critical role in the prosperity of London. And by the end of the 18th century, the sheer volume of goods coming into London via its river was astonishing. Ships coming here were supplying Londoners with all their luxury and exotic goods. Goods like chocolate, sugar, rum, pepper, teas and silks. And the population here just couldn't get enough of it. And the River Thames was struggling to cope. The entire width of the river was crammed with ships. More than 1,500 in an area meant for just 545. It was said that you could walk from one side to the other without getting your feet wet. This chaotic situation meant that ships were often stuck in the Thames for weeks and were regularly damaged. But by far the biggest problem was thieves. By the end of the century, it's estimated some 37,000 workers were employed on or around the Thames, and about a third of them were thought to be professional criminals. Now, these thieves had various names according to their particular brand of theft. You had river pirates, night plunderers, light horsemen, heavy horsemen, scuffle hunters and mudlarks. They were all bad for business and something had to change. A committee of powerful businessmen came up with the solution. In 1799, they built the city's first secure, enclosed docks here on the Isle of Dogs. The West India Dock was one of the most ambitious public building projects ever before attempted in England. Where I am here now was the import dock, where ships would sail in and offload their goods before heading round to the export dock to be loaded up and head back out down the Thames. This was a completely new way of operating. 
Until now, ships had been forced to moor in the river near London Bridge and wait for smaller boats to shuttle their goods upstream. The new docks would be far more efficient. For the first time, cargo could be offloaded and stored right here at the docks. Now these two buildings here, now the Museum of London Docklands, give you some idea of what the site would have been like. There were actually nine of these warehouses and in total, they could store the entire annual import of sugar and have enough room over for vast quantities of rum. But most importantly, it was completely safe because the docks were surrounded by a 30-foot high security wall. The West India docks and others like them would ease congestion on the Thames and ensure that London remained the world's busiest port. This upgrade to the river came in the nick of time, as London was about to be catapulted into the industrial age. Rapid growth and a population explosion would push the city to its limits. The 19th century would be London's toughest challenge yet. On the 28th of June, 1838, Londoners watched in awe as an 18-year-old princess was crowned. Queen Victoria would reign over an era of extraordinary progress and prosperity, and her capital would grow into the world's most powerful city. London was also becoming industrialized faster than any other city in the world. And in the 19th century, it entered the age of the factory. The Industrial Revolution was taking place and the capital was being transformed by new technology. But for some, there was a price to pay. As factories sprang up right across the east of the city, conditions for those who lived here became unbearable. In the 1830s, this part of southeast London was known as Jacob's Island, a densely built up commercial area of factories, tanneries, warehouses and mills with rickety old houses built in between them, all surrounded by a man-made ditch. All these new industries created pollution and the main waterway, once the area's lifeblood, turned into a deadly creek known as Folly Ditch. To give you some idea of what it was like to live here, Charles Dickens gave a vivid description in his bestseller, Oliver Twist. He wrote, dirt besmeared walls and decaying foundations, every loathsome indication of filth, rot and garbage. Dickens subsequently killed off his villain, Bill Sykes, in the mud of Folly Ditch. The mix of terrible sanitary conditions and industrial pollution was typical in East London and fumes from heavy industry and coal fires covered the streets in a dangerous smog. Those toxic conditions had a dreadful effect on the health of the population and we know that because it's written into their bones. At the Museum of London, bone expert Jelena Beckfalak is showing me the skeleton of a woman who lived through the Industrial Revolution in London. You could see changes in her lower legs, so in the tibiae, the shins, you can see they're very curved and bowed. They're almost like boomerangs, aren't they? They've, yes. Uh, so tell me what's caused that. She had rickets when she was younger, so the vitamin D deficiency. And that's caused by a lack of sunlight. Yes, and we begin to see an increase in these diseases of rickets and scurvy when it's becoming more urban and more industrial. You've got closer living quarters, more people crammed into smaller spaces, it's darker, the potential for all the different types of pollutants. I mean, these diseases that children were, were developing, I mean, it's, it's horrible to look at. It is. I mean, there were a lot of pressures and stresses that were being placed on people by the nature of the changes that are going on into London. It's actually pretty sobering looking at those skeletons and thinking about the terrible impact of industrialization on the people who lived through those dramatic years of change. All of those lives sacrificed in making London the greatest city in the world. As the century progressed, 
the pace of change showed no signs of slowing down. In fact, the capital was about to undergo another transformation. This time it was thanks to a new creation, the greatest invention of the Victorian age, the railways. And they changed the capital beyond all recognition. The first railway station in London was London Bridge, built in 1836, and that was just the beginning of railway mania. This is a snapshot of London near the start of this boom in the construction of the railways, and you can see on it the first major routes into the capital. You've got Euston Station up here, which was the terminus for the first long distance line into London, coming down from Birmingham. And you've got this line up here, the London and Greenwich Railway, which terminates at London Bridge. And then from the east, follow this line in to Fenchurch Street, which was the first railway station to be built within the city of London. This was a period of intense railway investment, driven by fiercely competitive private rail companies. By 1846, there were no less than 19 of them, with plans to build stations right in the middle of London. 19? I mean, it was bordering on the ridiculous. Just imagine what that would have done to the city. Thankfully, the government stepped in and decided to set up a royal commission to consider how to prevent London being destroyed by the railways. The commission came up with a rail exclusion zone. This meant that railway lines were not allowed to go all the way into the centre, but had to stop at its boundary. And this is where railway companies built their stations, each one trying to outdo the others with ever more spectacular architecture. The terminus here at London Paddington was built in 1854 by one of the most celebrated civil engineers in history, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. As chief engineer of the Great Western Railway, he was thrilled when he won the contract to design this station. And just look what he came up with. This was his masterpiece, designed to outdo the Great Northern Railway's terminus at Euston, two miles to the east. Brunel didn't hold back. At the time it was built, this was the largest train shed roof in the world. Even today, Paddington Station stands out as a spectacular piece of architecture. Brunel's Grand Station was soon followed by Victoria, Charing Cross, and in 1866, St Pancras. The railways changed the shape of London perhaps more than any other invention in its history. The capital began to expand rapidly outwards into the surrounding countryside, and thousands more people living in rural areas were now able to commute in. But there was one area of London cut off from the prosperity of the city. Northern villages like Highgate and Hampstead were built on hills far too steep to build a railway on. So the Victorian engineers came up with a plan to connect this area to the railway network. And I'm on my way now to see one of the best preserved abandoned Victorian railway stations in London to see what they came up with. Highgate was one of the first northern hillside villages to be joined to the city. Today, its old railway station is kept under lock and key. There we go. Lovely, thank you, Chris. Absolutely. Super. But Chris Nix from the London Transport Museum is giving me special access. That lovely cottage over there was part of the uh, first station here. When construction began in the 1860s, they cut a deep valley out of Highgate Hill and built the station in the dip. Do you do feel that you are in a bit of a cut-out bowl in here? You, you are. There was a natural dip in the land here originally, uh, and that was extended down to create this cutting. Mind the nettles and the brambles. <laughs> it is completely overgrown here now. It is. It? So the trains could reach the platforms, the Victorians used pioneering technology to blast tunnels through the hillside at each end of the station. Let's just uh, do the, the magic and unlock. 
Uh, Keys, so. more secret access. Oh, yeah. This door norm normally doesn't get unlocked because of the bats that are inside it. Fantastic. There is light at the end of the tunnel. You see the remains of the, the tracks there. Now this tunnel, the one just next to it, and the pair at the far end of the station penetrate right through the hillside here. Thanks to new tunnels like these, the capital could be connected to previously remote areas like Highgate. It meant London's boundaries could expand and more people could get into the centre of the city. This was part of a new concept of not having to work where you live. Arguably, this was the beginning of the age of the commuter. In the mid-19th century, an estimated 27,000 passengers were travelling into London every day. At the same time, the population of the city was exploding. At the beginning of the century, it had stood at one million, but by the 1850s, that number had trebled to a staggering three million. This rapid growth created serious problems because the capital was depending on a dangerously primitive water supply. Because homes and businesses didn't have modern toilets or running water, people had to draw all the water they needed for cooking, drinking and washing from communal wells or pumps. Their sewage was dumped directly into the Thames or into open pits called cesspools. These were perfect conditions for disease to spread. One of the most deadly diseases to hit the capital at this time was cholera. It had made its first grisly appearance in London in the 1830s, killing around 6,000 Londoners. By the 1850s, the death toll was much worse. In these Soho streets, there were more than 500 deadly attacks of cholera in just 10 days. Something had to be done to stop the relentless spread of the disease. I'm meeting author and historian Amanda Thomas to find out how local resident Dr John Snow stepped in to help. He very quickly realised from his past experience that it was likely that their drinking habits and their dietary habits were linked to their health. But people didn't believe him. No, absolutely not, because the, the general consensus of the time was that it was spread by miasma, by bad smells. And when you came to London in those days, the smells were, were abominable. So you can perfectly understand why people would think that disease would spread through bad smells. John Snow was convinced that people were being made ill by drinking contaminated water from a pump in Broad Street, but he had to prove it. And he did that by mapping the victims. So this is the map that John Snow used to work out how the cholera was spreading, right? This was the map that he produced, which was a stroke of genius, because each line represents a death. He added these extra lines to show how many people had died in each property to prove that it was the water from the pump that was causing the deaths. And I can see the pump is marked here, then that would have yep, been over just there. Just over there, exactly outside the pub and at the factory over there, where the high concentration of deaths were. They were specifically keeping water from the pump to use to drink. But yeah. actually, there are some patches here, like there's a little sort of bald spot here. Why was that? Yeah, that was the workhouse. And you would have thought, wouldn't you, that they were the worst effective. There were over 500 inmates, but only five died. He knew they had their own deep well. They weren't taking water from the pump. Snow took his research to the city officials and asked them to take the handle off the pump, making it impossible to draw water. They were reluctant to believe him, but they agreed to remove the handle as a trial. And not long afterwards, the outbreak of cholera stopped. It was proof that the water from the pump was the cause of the cholera outbreak. But the Victorian establishment was not for turning. They were so set on their miasma theory that even with the evidence staring them in the face, they rejected Snow's arguments. The whole city continued to dump their waste into the Thames and into cesspools, and so they continued to contaminate their own water supply. It would take more than the lives of the poor to spur them into action. By the mid-19th century, as more and more people flocked to the city, London's infrastructure was struggling to cope. 
it would take the genius of one remarkable man to save the city from squalor. By the mid-19th century, London was the most powerful capital in the world. But it was growing far too fast with a sewage system that was dangerously outdated. The tipping point came in the summer of 1858, when the city was hit by an oppressive heat wave. On June the 16th, the temperature reached 35 degrees Celsius, a record for the time, and Londoners could take no more. The stench of the Thames had become unbearable. The novelist Charles Dickens wrote, through the heart of the town, a deadly sewer ebbed and flowed. Centuries of slaughterhouse and industrial waste, plus human excrement, stewed in the heat of the river and baked on its banks. The Thames was now the most contaminated, the most unhygienic, the filthiest river in the world. At first, government ministers were resistant to any kind of reform because they knew it would involve a major overhaul of the entire infrastructure. But eventually the stink became overpowering. MPs were seen running from the chamber, holding handkerchiefs to their noses, complaining loudly. They even tried soaking the parliamentary curtains in lime chloride to mask the smell. Finally, the great stink, as it became known, forced the hand of Parliament and pushed through reforms that should have happened centuries before. On August the 2nd, the government passed an act instructing the Metropolitan Board of Works to produce a plan to carry London's rotting waste far away outside the city. The board's chief engineer was the brilliant Joseph Bazalgette, and he set about designing what was at the time the largest civil engineering project in the world. His plan was to channel all the city's waste far enough east so that when it discharged into the Thames, it would be swept out to sea on the tide. I'm meeting civil engineer Gordon Masterton, who's been studying Bazalgette's original plans for a sewer system. How much sewerage needed to be built? Yeah, well, Basel Jet Scheme had a total of 1,300 miles of sewers uh, to be reconstructed in London. 1,300 miles? Absolutely. And on top of that, the large interceptor sewers added together uh, amount to 82 miles of quite substantial diameter uh, sewers underneath the streets of London. To move the wastewater and excrement eastwards, Bazalgette's Jet's sewers made use of London's hilly terrain. The natural and easy solution is to go from the high ground to the low ground by gravity, where the gradients don't allow introducing pumping stations to lift the sewage vertically. All of that then flowed out along this final section here, and that's the entry point there into the Thames before being taken out Correct. to sea. The pipes to take all the effluent from London's population had to be huge, but Bazalgette doubled their size. If he'd not done that, it's estimated our sewers would have overflowed sometime in the 1960s. Bazalgette also came up with an ingenious plan to install them underneath the city. To avoid digging up vast swathes of London and causing mayhem on the streets, Bazalgette created huge embankments along the Thames to contain the massive main sewage pipes. This wall of Somerset House once stood in the Thames. But look at it now, it's dry as a bone. That's because between 1864 and 1870, Bazalgette reclaimed all of the land between here and the river over there, and in doing so, created the Victoria Embankment. Together, the Victoria, Albert and Chelsea embankments provided London with 52 acres of extra land where it was most congested. And in the middle of the embankment gardens, there's a fascinating remnant from the past that shows how the river once flowed through here. This image shows York House, a mansion that once stood on the banks of the Thames 
with these steps leading right down to the water. Today, York Water Gate is all that's left. This gate perched just as it was before on top of the steps, but with no real function. It's just left here, isolated in the middle of these gardens. Bazalgette is famous for sorting London's sewer problem, but he was also responsible for some much more attractive features of the city. As part of his job as an engineer, he was asked to inspect 12 of London's bridges, and he found that some of them were in a terrible state. Hammersmith Bridge was crumbling under the weight of London's increasing traffic. So in 1884, Bazalgette oversaw its reconstruction. When Bazalgette made his replacements, he included all the ornate decorative cast iron. And it is just stunning. Two miles downriver at Putney, he completely replaced the old bridge and built a new one out of granite. Today, it's one of London's busiest road bridges. Further east, Bazalgette designed the new Battersea Bridge. The bridge that Bazalgette replaced here connected the poorer district of Battersea on the south side of the river with the riches of Chelsea on the north. Even further east, Bazalgette found another bridge in a perilous state. Albert Bridge was so unstable, it was known as the Trembling Lady and a sign still hangs at its northern end, asking troops from nearby Chelsea Barracks to march out of step, because the vibrations from their footsteps strained the weakened bridge. So Bazalgette strengthened Albert Bridge with steel chains, ensuring it survived until today. Few Londoners have ever made such a lasting impression on their city. This is a monument to Bazalgette, and it's far too modest, in my opinion, because his remarkable sewer system not only cleaned up the city, he transformed this area of the capital, gave us all those wonderful bridges, and in my view, helped make London one of the most beautiful cities on the planet. In the final chapter of London's extraordinary story, we'll see how the capital grows to become a mega city, unrivaled in power and influence. It wasn't just the capital of Britain, it was the capital of the British Empire and of the British Commonwealth of Nations. How it endures two of the world's most terrible wars. And how it's transformed once again by Crossrail, one of the boldest engineering projects in London's entire history. Don't miss all that new next Tuesday at 9.15. Fighting to save lives, meet the emergency teams making split-second decisions in critical condition new tomorrow at 9. And tonight, what is normal? The House of Extraordinary People are taking on public perception as the new series continues next. <laughs>